Hello. Um, hi, T. Thank you so much for joining me as a part of our One Club Creative Month uh, speaker series. We are so, so excited to have you joining us and um, to get to chat a little bit about your experiences in the creative industry. So I will just kick things off with a little bit of an icebreaker. So Today, a big topic of conversation that we're going to chat about is gender identity. And, you know, one of the simplest ways that people can communicate their identity is through the use of gender pronouns. So, for example, I use they, them, and theirs pronouns. So I'd love to just start mm -hmm. things off by, you know, asking what pronouns you use. And just if you have any tips for folks who are maybe trying to be more mindful about asking people about their pronouns. Oh, sure. Um... I use she, they. Um, I use they for a number of reasons, actually. Um, not particularly because I'm uh, being non-binary. It's like I am trans, but 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 I identify very much um, as female. So I was using she, her for a long time. And then the more research I've been doing about um, gender identity, really, and, and gender as a whole, the more you begin to realize how um destructive the whole notion of having gendered pronouns is in language and how much um preconception and prejudice comes in the second you start talking about someone with regard to them being well whether he is like this or whether he is like that but then she if she would be very different so so i i use an example which is that i just start talking about a, a a sam that i know um and then i often talk about them as as an engineer and being quite tall and having dark hair and describe them and then actually if you ask people to stop and think about what this person looks like in their head they very frequently have used the idea that they're tall and an engineer to come to the conclusion that they must be male and they will have made some assumptions about that um and it, it it's um so it is very difficult for people to stop and think really about how important pronouns are like structurally mm -hmm. right at the start like before we begin to think about anything else um, that that difference between she and he makes them will make differences in in to you and how you approach that person um, and this is a this is something that maybe society should take a little bit more seriously so I'm very pro the notion of of um, sharing pronouns I think it's really interesting and there's loads of problematic spaces that arise when people kind of um, are asked to share pronouns because especially if you're in a, in a cis environment people sometimes think of this as being trivial or irrelevant because they present so strongly as male or female that that, that shouldn't be something that they need to do um, and the more <laughs> funnily enough the more people use non-binary pronouns the more um, sharply it draws into focus the 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 statement that you're, you're making by by using male pronouns um it's sort of in a way an announcement an announcement of privilege so um i think the 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 emphasis is not on if you if people want to be mindful about that mm. then it's it's not so much about encouraging it as a rote thing it's just about understanding it as i love seeing them in signatures i love seeing them in on business cards i love seeing them on Twitter handles, I think it is something that one should include um, as a kind of a default in, in any kind of um, attribution to, or, or, or wherever you put your name or wherever you put, put anything really. Um, but yeah, it's a very peculiar space because it kind of is really important in recognizing that there is gender diversity and also really important in um, starting a conversation about about where that where that stigma be begins um so so it's yeah it's, it's it's an icebreaker but it's a really <laughs> tricky icebreaker you can talk about it a lot <laughs> no, totally but i totally agree you know it's one of those things that everybody has a different relationship to um but that just kind of normalizing that conversation and bringing it to the forefront can be so impactful um, so cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much um, for your sharing your thoughts on that so now to kind of head into you know the real meat of the interview. Uh, so you've worked at Google for the past 12 years and you're currently the creative director of the Google Creative Lab in Sydney. And since you came out as a trans woman in 2015, you've also been a huge leading voice for LGBTQ activism within the creative industry. So first, I'd just love to know like, what drew you throughout your life to a creative career? How did you come to find yourself in that space to begin with? Um, it's quite a zigzaggy thing. 
I, I, I talk a lot to younger students who seem to be very clear about what they want to do and, and um, it's very interesting when you're talking to students and they, they want to ask you about being a creative director and it's like well it's quite a long way first to journey, it's quite a long journey before that um, I didn't I, I kind of found myself in a very weird stage which is that I was at university studying fine art just at the um, point at which the web I was there a long time ago, but I was there like 94 to 97. And um, um, that was when the web had just begun, like Tim Berners-Lee had kind of announced it in 93. So I remember doing kind of weird classes in this thing as if it was a completely new, mm -hmm. and it was a completely new space. And I remember thinking it was kind of rubbish, actually, and not really liking it very much. So I've had this sort of hate-hate um, relationship with technology from an early age. But I have forever been drawn to the frustrations of, of tech and the things that interest me, just like with any creator using any medium, it's not really so much, um, it's like how far you can push something. Like you, you enjoy your medium because um, it frustrates you and it has edges and you can't control it. Um, and that's always been the thing that I found interesting, but, but my, creative career has been mainly through taking jobs that I didn't um, hate. Mm -hmm. So I did a design job for a while um, at the Royal Academy of Arts. So I was a very bad developer and, a, and not very good at geeky um, coding things. But turns out I'm not a terribly good designer either, um, but I was doing sort of web stuff and designing a magazine at, at the Royal Academy of Arts for a few years and then I was freelancing, I was doing design management, and that was more um, about the, um, the um, um, this, this sort of, I don't know, I think I wanted to be in charge. Mm. Um, but then that removes you very much from the process and suddenly you're just writing emails all the time and getting cross with people for not doing things. Um, and then actually, funnily enough, I ended up taking a very, very, very quick gig, three weeks at Google in 2006 to do um, PowerPoint <laughs> and I'd never really used PowerPoint so um, it was um, I'd never actually used PowerPoint and I had no idea what it was but my friend said will you come in and do a few weeks for us and I think I was like sure and the money was nice and all of those sorts of things I didn't really want to work for a corporate um, but it turned out that that at that point I mean I blagged the interview and then it turns out PowerPoint's easy. So, so that was fine. And that's kind of my creative career. Like I've, since then, it's always been doing those. When, when there, there were all of these things that needed different skills at different times. And increasingly we would sort of buy YouTube or launch a new product or decide that we are going to have a, a, a browser. And we had to tell everyone what a browser was. Um, so it was also my career has also seen this kind of um, rollover. And I think it came from the tech, almost from the arrogance of the tech companies, believing that they didn't need advertising, um, that they were, that they were just themselves, that you should just put the product forward and it will speak for itself. And um, if you make it, they will come and all of this kind of language. So I found myself in an in-house role where there was no in-house. Um, mm -hmm building in-house capacity to make the kind of creative work that no agency was going to make for us. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what the Creative Lab has always done, has it been to make the kind of experiments and the kind of work that you, um, that were, was very, very difficult to get out of um, agencies, to get out of kind of traditional creative models, because those models were built much more around um, the structural, the structural infrastructure of the advertising industry and um, and we knew that actually by just doing experiments with Chrome or, or, or having fun with the, the phones or or playing with what YouTube could be we would actually reach well, we didn't know that we just guessed and that worked out quite well so um, now I still spend a lot of time exploring what will be interesting I spend a lot of time working with cultural groups and some of these things turn into huge projects like the art project turned into the cultural institute turned into google arts and culture and sometimes they turn into um dust just little fairy dust um and it's 
it, it, but it is a lot of the time about looking at where industry is headed. So it's sort of um, design research through practice, if that's a thing, where you explore and play with the technology and you create teams that can um, create those experiments to see what is interesting, what's going to happen, where, where we are going. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's been a really fascinating journey, but I don't think I've ever chosen it. Um, I'm just, it's being, it's creative because I'm creative, just because that's how my brain works. <laughs> I think. No, that's amazing. And, and, you know, throughout the course of your career, obviously, you know, you've had so many experiences, you've done so many different things. What was it like coming out as trans, you know, kind of after already having established yourself in your career, you know, after having all of those creative experiences, how did things shift mm. when you decided to come out in 2015? Um, those are two different questions. I think that the first one is that it was terrifying. It was mm. absolutely terrifying. Um, I wasn't really conscious of there being anyone at all. <laughs> I remember kind of researching to find out if there were any trans people at all in the advertising industry. There's a copywriter, I think, um, in New York, like, and that was kind of it um, at that stage. And, and thankfully, obviously, naturally, those things have changed. Um, but it was because it's sort of, you say, you, you, one comes out like, you have that whole, one has phases where would, one would like to and then you retreat because it is too scary. You, there is too much to lose. Um, you, you are not at that age where you have no choice. And I, I'm not sure whether this will ever be the same for future generations, which is kind of lovely. I hope that no one ever actually really feels like it simply isn't something that they can do. But for most of my life, it just simply, it wasn't, it wasn't possible. It wasn't even thinkable. So you retreat and you create other sort of identities and existences. And, and um, it's very, very strange looking back on, I, I still did a lot of talks, like there's a TED talk I did, um, like it, sort of literally like, I mean, it's about six months after I'd come out and, and I'd come out to my friends and things, but I certainly wasn't at a point where I was ready to um, share that. <laughs> so, but I do look, I look very skinny <laughs> because I lost all this weight. Because <laughs> obviously the first thing you do when you have no control over, your, over, your, over anything and you've lost everything, like everything has gone to hell. The first thing you do is um, um, take control of what you can, which meant in my case, losing about 20 kilos um so I give this very like and it's just peculiar because it's like this person who I know I mean I know them quite well but um yeah so Tom gives this talk in the opera house and there's two and a half thousand people in the opera house and and you look at it and you're like huh they're kind of cute um <laughs> but it was it feels so different now so since then yeah that idea of like it was terrifying and I, I just actually got to a point where I couldn't not do that anymore, where um, like it was going to kill me if I didn't. So I don't know, it's, it's a weird thing. Um, and then since then has been really curious as well, because obviously, um, yeah, you do move from you have to go through an awful lot. I think, again, it is a very selfish process. Uh, you have to um, unpick and, um, and reconfigure a lot of your relationships, a lot of, a lot of your personal and social and work um, relationships. A lot of things will change. And there are certain, um, certain aspects you, you can't possibly expect like my mental health deteriorated sort of after about two years of holding everything together my mental health suffered enormously and um and whilst google have been fantastic to work for actually and they've worked with me and i think if you're from on a surface level you don't tend to see those things but yeah that's been a really really significant part of my day-to-day -day life um since then so um yeah those, those that's sort of what's changed 
um, career-wise, again, I think it, it was at a moment when it became possible for um, for those for that sort of change to be acceptable, challenging, but not not career destroying. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's it's hard to say. I think it will be easier in another five years, five to ten years, to look back on and and give a clearer um, a clearer reading of, of of how it has affected things. Um, it's certainly, it's it's unexpected, <laughs> but it's been it's. I mean, you know, unexpected things happen to all of us. Look at look at where we are. This a remarkable situation. You know, you've previously kind of discussed the difference between inclusion and diversity. Could, so, could you speak a little bit more about the distinction between those two, and then also kind of where you see equity fitting into that conversation? Oh yeah, sure. I think this is great. And I think it's a really interesting, I mean, I hope it's interesting. I hope that it is not interesting. I think I, I, I do whenever I've done diversity talks at different conferences, things like um, Creative Week. And one of the great struggles is going, oh, right, actually, I need to swap the audience because the audience here already understand what I'm talking about. And I kind of need to go and talk to that bunch of guys in the other room that are listening to the celebrity talk because they're not going to learn anything from listening to the nice celebrity talking but they would learn an awful lot from from hearing hearing us talk from hearing people with um, lived experience talk and so um audience is an issue right now <laughs> like getting the right people to hear the right message and i'm sure this is the same with this film like i don't know it depends how it how it works but hopefully people will be listening who who weren't expecting us to talk about inclusion, although I'm sure they probably are, in which case they will understand that, that um, diversity, we're all diverse, everyone's diverse. And it's always been like the pushback on diversity, which is like, yeah, you can have a room of, of 10 white guys and they can all be very diverse. That's fine, they can have diverse ways of thinking, they can have diverse backgrounds, they can have many different intersections which make them diverse. That's fine. Um, if you exclude the ones who, if you are excluding on any level of privilege from within that diversity, you're still excluding them. They will still feel left out. You can guarantee your bottom dollar that the ones that do not go to the public school or did not go to a posh school or do not have the right accent or do not fit in in some way or who are neurodiverse, however their invisible difference manifests itself, they will be doing their utmost to mask and hide that in order to be more normal, to fit within whatever the normal is in that room. And that's what we call culture fit. And quite often we find ourselves hiring for culture fit, which is like, are they like the boss? Will the boss get on with them? Are they his type? Are they her type? Um, and that's an amazing kind of thing to do, which is basically to ask people who are different, who you want to include because it's important to have diversity of thought, but they need to be able to um, nor to assimilate into a normal practice. And then we slightly got to this point of going, okay, no, you don't need to assimilate, that's fine. Um, we've hired you to be you. And it is particularly pertinent when you get to race because, or, or gender, because if you have a, an entirely male team and you hire a woman, like first of all, they have to deal with the stigma of being the female who has been hired because there aren't enough females or being um, a sort of the black person that's in the room because everyone else is white or being, um, you know, this, this, these, these being disabled is a, is a horrific state to be where you actually feel um, like the only reason you are there. You do not feel included. Right. And this is inclusion. <laughs> This is, inclusion is, is also something which is not, you can't do diversity. <laughs> um, you can't do inclusion. You can be inclusive, but you can't be inclusive until you have a diverse group. Um, you, 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 you just can't, you can't be inclusive of a bunch of people who are all the same because that's sort of um, absurd. So yeah, so we have this difference between sort of diversity and inclusion and we're getting to the point where people are like, okay, like the idea that inclusion is actually on the people who were previously there to include and incorporate and allow 
for that person to feel part of a team, to feel part of a group, to be, be part of the decision making um, is, is the next stage. And I think that that is something that can be interrogated at any point in any team. It doesn't matter if you manage three people or 300 people or 3000 people, you will always have those structural issues to deal with. And it is incredibly difficult because very often you're dealing with um, deeply, deeply held kind of um, in invisible biases and, and prejudices. And then there's this kind of like crazy idea, <laughs> the nearest, latest letter to add, um, which is that actually maybe these people in need equity in the decision-making process. Maybe they need to, as long as feeling included, they need to feel that they that they are both valued and get value from the process within which they're included, um, because um, far too often we're included so that we can be there. And in order to to you know because we know that's the right thing to do, but but um, giving credence and giving weight to those um, voices is still a long way off, I think, in an enormous number of situations, actually. And I think that that's um, a huge challenge for, for businesses everywhere, which is to really, this is this normative thing again, really get to that stage where um, even the most difficult voices feel like they have equity, feel like they have something invested in the process and that they are valued as part of the process. That's, that's, there you go, that's my rant on, on equity and include, diversity and inclusion, sorry. No, no, that's amazing, and it's so true, it's so true, you know, I think it's great to have a lot of different people in a room, it's great to work towards, you know, diversity, but that's really only step one, and equity is hopefully the end goal, and, you know, it would be great if we could continue moving our industry in that direction and seeing other industries do the same, so absolutely. Uh, so you mentioned a little bit earlier um, that your book, Loud and Proud, uh, the collection of speeches from you know, significant members of the LGBTQ community, that is set to be released in May of this year. So yes. tell me a little bit about how this project came to be. What inspired you to put together this collection? Um, it um, is a... Um, um, well, it's an anthology, really, and it's curious because I, um, I, it, it, I was asked to do it by a friend, really, and then actually we were looking, part of it was looking and realising that there was no, there is no kind of accessible history to um, LGBTQ culture. Mm -hmm. um, I also have a, um, um, uh, 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 slight kind of, um, I don't know, not, 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 um, chip. Okay, yeah, I do have a slight chip on my shoulder about Stonewall, <laughs> about this idea that Stonewall was somehow, like, first of all, like, the whole myths and legends around Stonewall are so, so, so difficult and so, so hard to kind of unpick. And, and yet you, when you do listen to, like, lived experiences, when you do realise that the police weren't arresting gay men for being gay because that's not something you can really do, but they were arresting lesbians and trans people for wearing items of clothing, that's why, that, that's why Stormy's in the van. That's why, you know, that's where the books are being thrown. Like, it, it, you know, yes, there is, there is this Stonewall thing, but it's this astonishing kind of like, like very advertising sort of myth-making model where we start, um, where we say this is the birth of gay rights. And actually, I wanted to go. No, you go back to Germany, go back 120 years before that, and you've got Germans talking in Parliament about the right for men to love men and being shouted down and being exiled um, from like and living out their lives in Austria. You've got in 20, 30 years later, you've got the first kind of public speech by a lesbian again in Germany, by Anna Rehling. Um, the first gay rights movement in the States was started by a German in 1924. And like, and there were like uh, the Machin Society um, and the Daughters of Bitkis, like there were all of these, there were movements, there were m multiple kind of um, what would we call them? Um, um, not riots exactly, but certainly disturbances, like public order offences by by um, queer people. So 
there's this kind of long history and it's told best through the, the history of, of our, our oral tradition, our, our, the way in which we have um, spoken mm -hmm. and spoken truth to power um, rather more than representation, rather more than in, in um, popular culture, like the places that, that we kind of, that history emerges it only really exists in 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 um, in speeches. Like there's very peculiar things. Like the the like the um, this is what I mean about all these cycles. This extraordinary thing of talk about intersectionality. About there being many black gay women through the last fifty, sixty, seventy years who who we could probably name, and a really remarkably few black gay men, um, especially ones who have spoken out. I spent. The longest time trying to find a speech by James Baldwin in which he references his sexuality because he didn't he just didn't until the like quite late in his life and then only in sort of passing you know he writes this beautiful book which totally blows everyone's brains out Giovanni's room um in the 50s but he never speaks about it um and you have um um this total paucity within that community. And then you do begin to realize, actually, funnily enough, you begin to realize why black trans women get killed mm -hmm. um, in such numbers, because there has not been voices in that community speaking on, speaking authoritatively on, um, on their behalf and they get silenced. Um, it's like Rustin, Bayard Rustin from the civil rights movement, who should genuinely be considered to be one of the leading figures of the civil rights movement. And yet again, it's like kind of, I don't know what the phrase is, queer washed, like, like removed from the record because of their um, homosexuality and because they spoke about that. So he's like one of the heroes of my book, but like there are a lot, I'll dig it up, it's underneath someone's foot, um, typing away. And um, yeah, there are like, basically, here it is. It's such a tragedy because it's like, it would be, a, we should be doing like book launches and I was going to come to New York, and we're going to do a book launch there, and we're going to do one in LA, but instead of which we might do a virtual book launch, I've got lots of lovely friends um, who are going to read speeches from, um, from kind of through the last, well, through the last 150 years, from all different sort of aspects. And, um, and it's, what I like about it is, A, it's really pretty, which I think is very important. <laughs> and it has lovely illustrations. Um, and it's got the most peculiar people. It's like Mary Fisher, who I don't know if people understand as being a great hero, <laughs> but she's the, um, she is the kind of, um, the, the white blonde Republican who, who spoke up at the Republican convention and actually was the first person to tell the America what was like that other side of America that 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 people were dying um during the AIDS crisis you know you you begin to hear all, all these other voices and people around the world and, and it just turns it into a richer um broader story and and I hope that's what it does also I, I hope it's kind of like digestibly small you know that thing where you like I didn't want another book which is packed full of 200 word, I mean, not 200 words, 200 pages, just, just, just with lots of essays. I want to think of like nice, pretty pictures and relatively, <laughs> relatively condensable um, things that allow us to understand like our heritage and how long it's been there and actually how extraordinary it is to, to stand up rather than the long range missile approach we, we use more at the moment where we all make our videos and then fire them over. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, that idea of, of going into quite dangerous places and speaking and also of listening like of this no platforming thing is such a peculiar thing because it, it is the same thing it's like you have to listen mm. they may be idiots but they may also have points and if if deplatforming or no platforming had existed in with the virulence that it does now there is no way that any queer person would ever have been heard so there's this really strange kind of um philosophical um things that are thrown up plus there's a load of fantastic speeches so that's that project
which I'm quite glad you've done, but I'm sort of sad about the parties. I was really looking forward to that bit. <laughs> No, but that's so exciting. And I think that it's going to be so important, not just for, you know, non-LGBT people and allies to have access to that information, but even within the community, <clears throat> true. So often we've lost major figures and important people across history who just haven't really been centered in the conversation. And so that's so exciting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or just, just come from like the quite, not quite the right viewpoint. Like there's Vito Russo and Harry Hayes and all of these people where I remember going, huh, wow, you're actually kind of amazing. And <laughs> I felt really guilty. Like, cause it's like, I was writing at the start going like, it's such a shame there's no queer school. Like you sort of feel like there ought to be. <laughs> when you come out, there's like, oh, here's some basics you need to know. You need to do 101. Like here's your <laughs> queer history. Like here's what not to wear. Um, that sort of stuff should be, should be, um, and it's, it's not, there's no, no one, just like you, no one tells you how to be trans. And that's actually something that people, research a lot or it's like am I gay it's like well if you're <laughs> typing it into google there's a probably a good chance yeah um, <laughs> um those things are there's there we don't have that we don't have like a decades of of um socializing and schooling and and we don't get our kind of normative education which is probably why some parts of queer culture are a little bit rough around the edges um but uh, but yeah i hope so i hope it'll be there which sits on people's coffee tables and people pick up from time to time um who knows it's been so so great to have this conversation with you i cannot thank you enough for being a part of our creative month programming and you know we've been oh. working between these two time zones and we made it work so you know thank you so much t for joining me today and for just being so candid um, and sharing all of your amazing thoughts with us. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Have a great night. And um, thank you yeah. so much. Stay safe. <laughs> <laughs>